This is the Eisenhower home. A thousand dollars in 1898. Uh, so this was a street, and a street on this side. Uh, the Lincoln Elementary School sat right here. So the four to five homes that were out front were later moved. But in 1898, the family bought the home, and it was a six-room house. From the house to the museum was the land, two and a quarter acre land. Uh, so we'll let you come in and look through the house. There was a big garden, a chicken house, a barn. Uh, but Dwight was eight at the time he moved into the house. And he left this home in 1911, uh, going on to West Point. He was the third of seven boys. The fun thing about the house, it's the original site and the original furniture. The Eisenhowers were the third and last owners living here. And come right on in. Thank you. It was opened in 1947 as a World War II Veterans Memorial. Dwight's mother. It was Ida? Ida Eisenhower was mother. David Eisenhower was father. She died in 1946. Her husband David died in 1942. Look at the incredible resemblance. I know. Put a uniform on her and you got Ike. At the time that photo was taken in her later years was in the front parlor of this house in the little chair by the old secretary. Of course, you can look in this photo and look in that room and see the uh, same pattern as what she had of the rug and wallpaper, but they are new reproductions of what she had. Step in and see the family Bible. The boys were born in Hope, Kansas and Abilene, Kansas. He was born in Dennis? Dennis in Texas, October Dennis, 14, Texas. 1890. He was Ida and David's third son. Their fifth child died of diphtheria as a little boy. The marriage license is lovely on the wall above the Bible. That's his mom and dad's, 1885. They met and married at a college in Lecompton, Kansas. That's the group of guys and gals at Lane University where they met um, at the college there they attended. The boys were not allowed in this parlor because this was the company parlor. Uh, everyone had two parlors, one you used and one you didn't. All their family books you can see, uh, but this was where the boys had to ask to go in the park. The family home, when they bought it in 1898, from Dwight's uncle on condition Grandpa could move in in any time, and uh, there was no electric, no plumbing. So in 1904, Dwight's father got a book on how to do your own wiring, and that's what him and the boys did wired the house and got electric in 1904. Which was rather early, really. Yes. Living in town made a world of difference than living in the country. And Abilene was a very prosperous town at that time. Um, it, you know, had the railroad. Uh, it was the end of the Chisholm Trail, uh, the cattle head. So... What did his dad do for a living? He worked uh, 24 years at the Bell Springs Creamery and Ice House and 16 years with the utility company. All six boys and the parents shared those three bedrooms uh, for two years. Mom and dad was in number one, and then by 1900, Dwight and Edgar took that room over. You can see the chamber pot. Roy, Earl, and Milton in the second bedroom. And Arthur had an advantage. He was the oldest son, so he never shared this six by seven bedroom right above the entryway, right above our heads. So uh, he was in number three bedroom. I and David got a brand new bedroom at the foot of the stairway you see right here, and that was for mom and dad. Well, I date myself if I tell you I remember my mother had a Singer sewing machine. Uh, my grandma had a Singer sewing machine, I remember. This one has a beautiful lid on it. My grandma's was a drop-in. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one, I think, is much older, but beautiful. Um, the twin beds, the boys got Ida and Nurse's Aid in the twin beds after they lost their dad in 42. The lovely quilts on those beds were done by her. Where she found the time, I... I can never figure that out. But um, the quilts, pillows, all the fancy work was done by Ida. Her and the boys took care of the land going east, put food on the table, while uh, Dad worked 24 years at the Bell Springs Creamery and Ice House as a maintenance man and refrigeration, 
and 16 years with the local gas company. But this was considered the wrong side of the tracks on the edge of town. It was not the money side. The money side uh, was the big uh, homes all north. But this would have been a middle class house. Average little home as the years average. went. But as the boys uh, were asked once, were you poor growing up? And they said, yeah, but they never knew it. Everyone says that. And, I, you know, the boys were very outstanding. Ida was asked, aren't you proud of your famous son? And her comment was, yeah, which one? Arthur was a banker in Kansas City. Edgar was the lawyer in Washington. Dwight put through college. Of course, Dwight. Uh, Roy, Junction City pharmacist. Paul died at 10 months old of diphtheria. Earl was a mechanical engineer, newspaper man in Illinois. And the son, Milton, born in this home, the only one, baby of the family, was doctor of education, president of K-State, Penn State, and Johns Hopkins, and worked many and years Columbia in Columbia, too? No, Dwight was Columbia. Dwight was Columbia. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, but Milton was, Milton. No, Milton was K-State, Penn State, and Johns Hopkins. Well, okay, Hopkins, so, exactly. Okay. Yes. And down the hall, here's a lovely piece she made as well. Call again, painted on glass and foil behind it. Then we'll step in the family room when you're ready. The TV room with no TV. <laughs> That's where she found the dome. <laughs> this is the family room. Yeah, this is uh, like our family rooms today. Uh, six boys sat on the floor and filled it up quickly, as you can see. Uh, the piano was a beautiful piece of furniture that Ida bought for $600 in 1883. That was a lot of money. She gave all her sons lessons, and they all could play, but only the oldest and youngest enjoyed music like their mother, Ida. The beautiful clock above the piano and the dining room clock on the uh, mantel, wedding gifts, 1885. Not bad for 127 years old, and they still work chime on the hour and a half hour. In her later years, she sat in the little rocker and listened to the war news off the radio her sons gave her the, uh, in the 40s. That's a Spartan radio. The pillow, of course, you see with the family name she had done, all her sons. Shop Project, AHS, Abilene High School, that footstool. All the boys claim it only one made it, so she probably had six somewhere around the house. But that was one of the boys' school projects. And this coverlet, plaid coverlet on the fainting couch, over 160 years old. Beautiful piece. Woven in Pennsylvania by Dwight's great-grandfather. He was a professional weaver. And those are the pillows of Ida and David. Dwight's mom and dad. Dwight as a cadet at West Point. But the boys wired the house with electric. Uh, 1915, Dwight was 18, no, excuse me, 1908, they got running water, indoor plumbing. So, the first um, six years, that was grandfather's bedroom, starting in 1900. So, Jacob Eisenhower spent six years with him. Uh, this was kitchen-dining room combination. This half kitchen, this half dining room for 17 years. Her wood stove was replaced by this beautiful sideboard. That piece of furniture cost the family $5 second hand from a local doctor's wife. Isn't that pretty? But I imagine with six boys, and um, that was a lot of money, $5. So by 1915, they added the kitchen, back porch, and pantry. That was the kitchen, the back porch, uh, the pantry. And that was all done the year Dwight graduated from West Point. The original basement was a uh, storm shelter, um, a root cellar, you know, uh, that's where all the canning and stuff was done. Telephone worked up until 1946, sits in the corner on the wall, and that's used by the family up until Ida's death. And after work, Father Eisenhower hung his hat right there in the corner, so that way the boys knew Dad was home when his hat was hanging. Party line telephone. Yeah, yep, yeah, everyone listened in. That's how they got their news. 
Now, in the nowadays, you have to have a recommendation from usually a politician to go to West Point. He did too. He wrote a letter to Senator Bristow, and that's how he got appointed to go to West Point. Mm -hmm. So this piece was kept in the kitchen because the heat from the stove made the dough rise. She made nine loaves of bread every other day. The plates are pretty. A uh, gift to the parents from Dwight and Mamie in 1932. They're commemorative plates of George Washington's 200th birthday. Ida and David is pictured in the home here, right there, front part of the house celebrating their 50th anniversary. By the time she lost her husband in 42, they have 56 years of marriage. That photograph of Dwight, 1941, celebrating uh, receiving his first star. By 1944, he had five stars. Dwight and Mamie married and had a family of two boys in the Place of Meditation Chapel is their firstborn down. He died of scarlet fever at three and a half, four years old, and John's pictured right here. He just got done celebrating his 90th birthday in August. Dwight and Mamie's son is John, still living. John's the father of David Eisenhower and three girls. So where did Mamie Dowd Eisenhower come from? Was she local? Born in Boone, Iowa, grew up in Denver, Colorado, and they met while he was stationed in Texas. She had family and friends there. Down here by the exit door are photos of mom, dad, and the boys. In 1902, they were all young and Dwight was 12 years old in the far left corner. 24 years later, he was 36 years old in the major in the far left corner. They're the exact same people, exact same arrangement. In 1902, everybody mistaken little Milton as a girl because he didn't have his hair cut yet. And that was the Buster Brown look with the long hair. But he became quite handsome right here, and that was Milton. But quite a family of achievers. And this is the home Dwight came back to visit as much as he could. Uh, once he left in 1911, he never lived in Abilene. Of course, uh, the only home they ever really ever owned uh, was at the farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And this is where Dwight will walk. Please look around. You'll exit out this back door whenever you're done looking. Thank you. Uh huh. You're welcome. But uh, yeah. It, it's amazing. I, like I say, I say throw a uniform on her and you got like. But it was amazing. But they were an amazing family. So we just came out of the uh, home. And now this is the museum. And we're going over there. But just to move around to the left. Again, this is the home right here. We just came out of. And over here to the left is the church where they're buried. It was interesting to hear that the family were pacifists. And they said the only time the mother Ike's mother cried was when he went off to West Point. We're the only ones here. It's amazing. This is the museum.
the library. And the home. The church is actually behind the home. This is the library. Statue of Ike is behind me. Coming around. This is the church. The home. and the museum. In front of the statue, it says, Champion of Peace. This electric car belonged to Mamie's mother. This is some of Ma Mamie's hats.
by the political and military leaders of the Allied nations and the Axis Alliance. The Axis Alliance is formed in 1936 when Hitler joins forces with fascist dictator Benito Mussolini of Italy to support Francisco Franco, head of Spain's nationalist army in the Spanish Civil War. Mussolini pompously hails the Berlin Road connection as an axis around which all states and nations interested in collaboration may revolve. Japan, bent on dominance of East Asia, soon signs a pact with fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. The three-pronged Axis alliance masks its goal of world conquest behind a unified pledge to fight the spread of communism. Adolf Hitler, their Fuhrer, dictator of Germany and commander-in-chief of all German armed forces through Oberkommando der Wehrmacht. On D-Day 1944, Hitler will command his forces from a map room at OKW, Armed Forces High Command Headquarters in Rostenburg, Germany. General Philip Marshal Wilhelm Keitel. Keitel serves as Chief of Staff for Oberkommando der Wehrmacht overseeing all Axis command units in the defense of Europe. General Oberst Alfred Jodl, as Hitler's chief of operations staff for Oberkommando de Romag, Jodl reports to Hitler on the status of Axis defense operations along the coast of France. General Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, OB West. As Commander-in-Chief of Oberbefehl's Harbor West, von Rundstedt must deploy the warm, ragged, half-shot Western defensive force of the German Army against all anticipated Allied landings in France. General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, nicknamed the Desert Fox for his exploits in North Africa, Rommel will lead Germany's vaunted Army Group B in defense of the French coast. Reich Marshal Hermann Göring, Commander-in-Chief of the Luftwaffe. Göring's decimated air force must deliver widespread fighter and bomber defense against the Allied invasion of France. Emperor Hirohito of Japan, the divine ruler, the living god of the Shinto religion. His governing powers are limited, but his symbolic strength is supreme over all Japan. Hideki Tojo, War Minister of Japan. Nicknamed the Razor, Tojo holds supreme command over Japan's military machine during the early years of World War II. Admiral Isoroko Yamamoto, Japan's most brilliant naval strategist. Early in the war, Yamamoto pushes for a quick knockout punch against the U.S. Pacific Fleet. His partial success at Pearl Harbor is offset by a crushing defeat at Midway in June 1942. Minoru Genda, a former attaché to the Japanese embassy in London, Genda is credited with planning the attack on Pearl Harbor. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Commander-in-Chief of American Fighting Forces, Roosevelt's firm resolve his warm relationships with Churchill and his conciliatory manner with Joseph Stalin helped to mold the Allied war effort in Europe and the Pacific. Prime Minister Winston Churchill, famed for his V for Victory sign, his cigars, and his stirring speeches. Many Allied triumphs throughout the war are linked to the tactical resolve and growling gumption of Winnie the Downing Street warrior. On the eve of D-Day, only King George himself can dissuade Churchill from hitching a ride with the invasion fleet. General George Marshall, Chief of Staff, U.S. Army. General Marshall is a key architect of Allied command for the assault on Europe. Marshall's choice of General Dwight D. Eisenhower as Supreme Commander of Shape wins the approval of Roosevelt and Churchill. Admiral Ernest J. King, serves as Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Fleet, and Chief of Naval Operations. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, a military meteor on the rise. In January 1944, Eisenhower becomes Supreme Commander for Shank, the Allied Command Group for Operation Overlord, the invasion of Europe. 
known throughout the ranks as the boss, Ike is a personable, no-nonsense commander without fear. Lieutenant General Walter Bedell Smith, Chief of Staff to General Eisenhower for Operation Overlord. Smith has been Eisenhower's chief organizer since 1942. Many call him the general manager of the war. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, named as Deputy Supreme Commander with shape for the deployment of Operation Overlord. Tedder is highly respected by Eisenhower, who considers him one of the best military minds in the world. Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, named by Eisenhower as Commander of the Allied Naval Forces for the Allied Invasion of Europe. General Sir Bernard Montgomery, precise, methodical, vain, and often boastful, Montgomery is the only general to defeat Rommel three times during the war. Monty is appointed to shape as commander of the 21st Army Group for the Allied invasion of Europe. Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, veteran air commander during the Battle of Britain, Lee Mallory is named commander of Allied Air Forces for Operation Overlord. Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, a veteran of North Africa and Sicily. Bradley is named Commander of In Invasion Forces for the U.S. First Army in Operation Overlord. Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey, named Commander of Main Invasion Forces for the British Second Army. Operation Overlord, the largest amphibious landing operation in history. The Allied return to mainland Europe. How was Operation Overlord organized and coordinated? What happened on D-Day? The story begins six months after America's entry into World War II. May 1942. From North Africa to Greece, from Burma to the Philippines, Axis forces smash and destroy. Allied forces are scattered disorganized, and still on the defensive. In Washington, General Dwight Eisenhower, head of the U.S. Army Operations and Planning Department for the Chief of Staff, advocates a focused Allied effort, a combined offensive in Europe. Beginning with the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and their advisors reaffirmed their intent to defeat Hitler before the Japanese. On January 14, 1944, General Eisenhower arrives in London to assume his duties as commander of Schaaf, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. Schaaf will coordinate Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Fortress Europe. Southern England becomes a military encampment. Allied troops there will soon top three million. With the troops come the supplies. Endless supplies. By March 1944, a half million tons are landing monthly. The Americans alone stock 700,000 items, ranging from 8,000 planes to 100,000 packs of gum and 54,000 supply corpsmen just to keep track of it all. Soldiers are housed in manor houses, cottages, schools, tent cities, and tin sheds. Secrecy is paramount. Spies may be everywhere. Morale is strained. Veterans of Tunisia, Salerno, and Anzio Beach are told not to discuss their experiences. They are ordered to attend rookie training exercises at a salt school on the Devon coast. Every man in the ranks knows something very big is up, but where and when? In Germany, Nazi high command wants answers. An Allied invasion is coming, but where and when? Deception is important to the Allied plans. Keep Hitler guessing. Make him think the Allies may invade anywhere. Will it be Norway? In northern Scotland, fake twin-engine bombers appear on Scottish airfields. False wedding announcements for fictitious soldiers are printed in newspapers. There is no northern army, but the deception works. Hitler moves thousands of troops north to repel an Allied landing in Norway. 
will it be the Falcons? An English actor doubling for Field Marshal Montgomery is sent to Gibraltar. German spies believe Monty has arrived to lead an Allied invasion from the Mediterranean. Hitler moves three divisions south, just in case. Will it be Calais? Dummy landing barges appear at Ramsgate and Hastings. Dummy tanks, too. A phony oil dock springs up at Dover, built by movie stagehands. Rumors fly that the leader most feared by the Germans, General George S. Patton, has arrived in London to take command of Fortitude South, a huge Allied strike force headed straight across the English Channel from Dover. The deception works again. Hitler overestimates the Allied strength. General Feldmarschall von Rundstedt masses German defenses for an invasion at Calais. Allied intelligence plays a trump card. A primitive British computer called Ultra is used to break the top secret German Enigma codes. Ultra locks into German radio frequencies, decodes information on German troop movements, and transmits false information regarding the Allies. Meanwhile, Schaaf commanders select the real site for invasion, Normandy, a quiet stretch of French coastland leading up to the Cotentin Peninsula between the port cities of La Havre and Cherbourg. As troop numbers build and D-Day approaches, many Allied unit commanders worry about the newest arrivals. The veterans are more than ready, but what about the real greenies? Equipment arrives late. Vital supplies are stolen. Men are short of skills. Short on battle savvy. Shape orders Exercise Tiger, a nighttime training run under simulated invasion conditions at Slapton Sands, east of Plymouth, England. But Exercise Tiger goes sour when German e-boats discover defenseless and cumbersome Allied LSTs off the coast. Roaring in at close range with torpedoes and 40 millimeter guns, the E-boats claw at their hapless victims. By night's end, over 700 troops of the U.S. 7th Army are dead. The incident is hushed up by Schaaf Command. Meanwhile, U.S. Air Forces pound Europe with endless bombing raids, striking at vital enemy supply lines, hammering at Germany's war machine. Poised and ready for the order to move, nature turns against the Allies. A month of warm, sunny weather gives way to driving rain, high winds, and heavy seas. As the time for launch approaches, tension grows. The Ultra Decoding reports that Rommel has shifted more Panzer divisions, infantry, and anti-glider forces to the coast of Normandy. Does he know? Is the secret out? Schaaf Command can only speculate. Finally, at 4 a.m. on June 5th, RAF meteorologist J.M. Stagg predicts a short break in the weather, scheduled to arrive the morning of June 6th. General Eisenhower takes full responsibility for the decision, then issues the order a free world has been waiting to hear. Okay, let's go. From ports throughout Britain, 1,200 warships, 4,000 landing craft, and 150,000 first wave assault troops put out into the blustery English Channel. Their targets, five beaches, codenamed Omaha, Utah, Sword, Juno, and Gold. From the airfields throughout Britain, paratroopers, commandos, airborne infantry, 11,000 planes, and 3,500 gliders embark on their mission to destroy bridges, coastal batteries, and enemy defenses. In Normandy, the weather is still bad. The Germans expect nothing. Rommel is in Germany, celebrating his wife's birthday. Senior officers are away at war games in Brittany, far from the beaches. Then, at 16 minutes past midnight, on the morning of June 6th, the skies begin to clear. D-Day commences. The Germans are caught completely off guard. Allied Pathfinder paratroops land and mark out drop zones, while British gliders deliver airborne commandos precisely on target, 
to capture the crossings of the Kong Canal and the Orne River. But transport planes filled with American paratroopers suddenly hit clouds over the coast. Heavy flight rips through the night. Formations break down. Drops are strewn over a hundred square miles. The 82nd Airborne sustains terrible losses from German soldiers in San Mergelis. Private John Steele's parachute snags on the town's clock tower. He watches helplessly as the 82nd fights for the town. Many troopers drown when they jump into flooded fields near the Dubo River. But the survivors prevail, regroup, and destroy the Mervale battery overlooking Sword Beach. Dummy parachutes, rigged to explode like machine gun fire on impact and broadcast loud battle commands, are dropped all over Normandy, further confusing the Germans. A handful of paratroopers from the 101st stumble upon a battery of four enemy cannon trained by Utah Beach. They take out the defenders. One soldier later recalls, We knew what was happening, but didn't know where we were. The Germans knew where we were, but they didn't know what was happening. At dawn, the Allied Armada opens up a furious bombardment. Allied fighters straight enemy positions. Two convoys struggle through raging seas. H hour, 6.30 a.m., June 6th. The U.S. 7th Corps lands south of Utah Beach. By dusk, 23,000 troops have landed, with a loss of only 200 men. A Signal Corps photographer takes photos, attaches the film to a carrier pigeon, and lets it loose. The pigeon flies east instead of west. The pictures soon appear in a German newspaper. Meanwhile, British and Canadian assault waves strike at Gold, Juno, and Sword. By dusk, 25,000 British troops are ashore at Gold Beach. The towns of La Amal and Amash are captured. At Juno, determined Canadian assault troops battle through German defenders. By nightfall, they reach Caen, but Rommel's panzers pound back, holding the town. At Sword, the landing is easier than anyone has expected. By midday, assault troops link up with free French commandos and paratroopers to secure Wiesterham and Ermanville. But Omaha Beach is a different story. Hitler mixes politics with hooliganism 
to take control of the government. Stormtroopers terrorize the streets. SS guards crush all opposition. In Frankfurt, Hitler tells followers, I don't have to worry about justice. My mission is only to destroy and exterminate. By 1933, Hitler is elected chancellor and president of Nazi Germany. He promises a new millennium for Deutschland, a new empire, the Third Reich. March 1938, the Nazis annex Austria. France and Britain rush to appease Hitler. The Munich Pact cedes the Sudetenland, Bohemia, and Moravia to Germany. Chamberlain returns home to England promising peace with honor, peace in our time. But Hitler has no desire for peace, no need for honor. Across Europe, anxiety builds. November 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. Hitler launches spontaneous acts of violence against all Jews in Germany. In 24 hours, 7,000 businesses are destroyed. 100 Jews are killed. Another 30,000 are sent to Hitler's recently formed concentration camps. August 31st, 1939. Blitzkrieg. German aerial bombing rains death from the skies. Panzer divisions roll eastward. Diplomacy and appeasement have failed. Poland has been invaded. Promises to allies must now be kept. Britain and France issue the call to war. The Second World War has begun. This is the entrance to the Eisenhower Library. This is the museum taken from uh, the front of the library. And you see the wheat mill in the background. The entrance to the library. That's what you know. exterior is constructed of limestone, quarry and cottonwood falls, Kansas. Another Kansas touch is the ornamental buffalo head and blue stem brass metalwork. The interior walls are made of book matched marble from Italy. The marble is an inch and a half thick throughout the building. The floors are also Italian marble and are trimmed with marble from France. Another interesting part of this building is the five star design and the light fixtures. The most common question we get from visitors to this building is, if this is a library, where are the books? We are a library, but we're a special kind of library, a manuscripts repository. This means that in addition to a few thousand books, we have almost 26 million pages of historical documents. The majority of these historical documents are the pre-presidential, presidential, and post-presidential papers of General of the Army and President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. We'll see some of these historical treasures in a few minutes, but first we're going to go behind the scenes to see some of the work that goes on behind these walls in a presidential library. We'll visit the presidential room next. Well, this is where President Eisenhower worked when he was in Abilene. The books and many of the furnishings you see were used by President Eisenhower. In fact, many come from the White House. The office is now used by the director of the Eisenhower Presidential Library Museum. Ike's office isn't big enough to hold all of his records, so we keep them in an area we call the stacks. Now in the archive stacks, this is one of four levels in the building that contain archival records. We have, as I mentioned earlier, about 26 million pages of documents. The majority of these are the pre-presidential, presidential, and post-presidential papers of President Eisenhower 
But we also have the papers of about 450 of his military and political associates. These records are unique. This is the only place in the world where you can see them. So scholars, historians, journalists, and graduate students come from around the world to view these records here in Abilene. Not all the records, however, are available yet for research. Some are still security classified. In fact, about 300,000 pages are still classified. And our staff works with different federal agencies to declassify the records. But it's a long-term process. Another long-term process is the preservation of the records. Records are made of organic material, and they're in a continual state of decay, so we have to take measures to slow that decay. One way we do that is by maintaining the proper temperature and humidity levels in the building. Even the copper ductwork that you can see is part of the preservation process. Next, we're going to the area where many of our archivists work. Chris is a processing archivist. He works with new material as it arrives at the library. It might surprise you to learn that we are still finding new records on the Eisenhower administration. We assign it a unique number and do an estimate on the total number of items in that collection. And when we process the collection, each individual item is assigned a unique identification number and it's catalog. Tell us about the gloves you're wearing. Well, we wear the gloves to protect the photographs. They're very susceptible to environmental and chemical damage. So these help with the transfer of acids from your fingers. And then we place each item into a polyester sleeve for additional protection. Then these items are placed in an acid free linen box. Do color photographs require the same kind of treatment, or is there more than you do? Yes, color photos, we do the extra step of putting them into our cold storage unit, which gives them additional safeguarding. As Chris and Kathy both mentioned, Paper and audiovisual records often need special treatment before they can be provided to researchers or placed in the archive stacks. The preservation lab provides us with the space where we can take care of the additional preservation needs of our collections. You've already heard about the folders and, do and boxes that we use that are acid free that we put the documents in when we process the collections. You've also heard about the temperature and humidity controls of the stacks. If we have additional preservation needs, this is an area where we can take care of them. For instance, sometimes we get documents that are very fragile or torn, like this one is, and we can't allow researchers to handle them like that. So what we do is put them in these special polyester enclosures that allows the researchers to handle the document and it keeps all the pieces of the torn document together. Sometimes we get items that are too big to fit in a standard size box. So we have custom boxes made. For instance, in this scrapbook, we have a box that opens flat and allows researchers to look through the pages of the scrapbook without causing any further damage to it. And one additional thing that we can do here, sometimes we get documents that are rolled up or folded and very brittle. And this document, for instance, we just received, and you can see how it's rolled up and fairly brittle and there's no way a researcher could use that. We can humidify the document so that it's not brittle and then we can flatten it and once the document is flattened we put it in a special file folder just to fit like this folder so that a researcher can look at this folder and it's nice and flat and it won't cause any damage while the researcher handles it. The behind the scenes work you've seen so far is all in preparation for some of the most important work we do here, providing records to researchers. Reference requests come to us by telephone, by email, and even occasionally by postal mail. The reference service we provide actually falls into two categories. As you might expect, we answer lots of questions. But we also work to make sure that our most frequently requested records, uh, be it photographs or documents, are accessible online. Many items have been digitized and placed on our website so that people around the world can view them. We answer around 2,700 reference inquiries from all over the world every year. Some of those questions come from now scholars, um, others from graduate students working on research projects, but many of them come from ordinary people. For instance, on a typical day, an archivist may help a Turkish graduate student who's uh, planning an international trip to do research on the modernization of Turkey's military and America's role in that. And next, they may help a woman 
uh, find a letter that she wrote to President Eisenhower when she was in grade school. Now here's an example of a letter and a photograph that was sent to Eisenhower by a proud father. It's one of tens of thousands of letters that he received as president, and today it's part of the White House alphabetical file. Too young to know a dictaphone machine, huh? Yeah. That's sort of the rage up until the late 50s. Right. On our drive to Abilene yesterday, on Route 70, we ran into thousands of windmills. Amazing, we've never seen anything like it. Just went on and on and on. And we've seen a lot of this out here. Uh, and you see the solar panels there. Structures, each weighing 7,000 tons, had been towed across the channel. Some 200 tugs were engaged on this job alone. Okay. As they were brought into position, the valves were opened and the sea rushed in. 
This is a Nazi soldier. And on the buckle it says, God is with us.
in the final years of his administration, when President Eisenhower calls on business owners, urging civil rights activists to solve the problems of immigration and the understanding of the problems. Much of what will take place in the fight for civil rights in the next several years and its beginnings during the Eisenhower. The threat of internal subversion began to occupy the thoughts of Congress as well as the American people. In 1945, the House American Activities Committee was formed to probe labor, the federal government, and even the movie industry in search of communists and communist sympathizers. In 1948, for modern American policy with communists around the world, the communist issue of security at home does not of selling atomic bomb secrets to the Soviets. <laughs> This is Ike's teleprompter. I would sit on a chair and put one on one arm of the chair and the other on the other arm and hold the two report cards up and compare them line by line. He had this one little thing that I think was inconsistent. He uh, had sort of a attitude to, unless you're brought up in Abilene, Kansas, you really can't amount to much. But he raised me in Washington. <laughs> he did have a, a very festive side to him. He did a lot of backyard barbecuing. He loved to cook. And he was always the cook. And it, it always it was great fanfare. And he had his secret recipes. And to this day, we're still trying to find out how he made the food that he did, which was absolutely delicious. And he literally would not tell anybody and went to his grave with it. And he used to have a, um, an apron that said, Hail to the Chef on it. And I got quite a kick out of that. Going golf, you know, I had golf lessons starting in 95, and then for years and years and so on. He spoke at my sister's graduation, Sister Anne's graduation. It was a difficult moment for me because there, were, there, there was a group of girls in the school that weren't happy that he was coming. They were afraid that this was going to take attention away from them and their day. And they made it very clear to me. She went to an all-girls school. As often would happen, while he was talking, I didn't listen to a word he said. At the end, he all of a sudden, this was when miniskirts were, you know, in style, they literally measured our skirts. They had to be a certain length or else they wouldn't let us graduate. And at the very end of the uh, very, very serious speech about education, uh, he said, if I have only one thought to leave with you today, it would be the following. Always remember that ankles are neat and knees will always be knobby. And that was the last of his speech, and of course everybody howled and thought that was great. And cheering, clapping. It was one of the first times that I realized what an impression he made on people. 
So his last birthday, when he was in the hospital, I was there and I had on a mini skirt, you know, major following the fashions. And uh, another general was in the room with him and um, looked at him and said, uh, okay, general, what do you think about uh, your granddaughter's mini skirt? And he says, her knees are too young to be knobby. <laughs> <laughs> was extremely plain, uh, had come from, I don't want to call it a frivolous background, but certainly one much less intense than my grandfather's. As a result, uh, she enjoyed having people around all of the time. She enjoyed uh, parties. She enjoyed her grandchildren tremendously. She never treated um, us as uh, grandchildren as we got older, but rather as friends. So that it was very um, palsy kind of conversation. I feel like I you know, had a real insight into my grandparents' relationship. You win a war, there will be enough left in this country so the other guy wiped out. Dwight Eisenhower's true career, his real impact on the world scene, is World War II in what sense? The chapel where they were buried is right behind me. This is another view of the house, a little bit later in the day. And over here is the chapel where they're buried. <laughs> 